get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, A Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited. We have Aaron Walker, founder of View From The Top, where he coaches business leaders with his over 35 years of entrepreneurship experience and eight successful businesses. His companies included Pawn Shops, that he started when he was only 18 years old. He ended up selling it to a Fortune 500 company called Cash America USA at 27 for seven figures. He also started a multi-million dollar construction company, that among the eight businesses. The most impressive thing about Aaron is he's been married for 35 over 35 years with his wife Robin. He has two daughters and five grandchildren. Aaron, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. You made me tired, all that 35-year business and 37 <laughs> years of business. I think, I need a nap. Well, <laughs> you started good. so young. I did. I started. My uh, wife tells me I came out of the womb grown. You know, I started working really early, which is true. You know, I love to work. I love what I do. So what can I say? Yeah, and we're going to talk about a lot of things, and I want to talk about your wife and your relationship with your wife because I think this is so important in entrepreneurship. And, but first I want to talk about a fun fact about you that most people don't know. And you're smiling for a second, but, um, <laughs> there's no telling you know, what's coming here. Fun. I'm afraid maybe I need to hit the off button. This but. is the funny thing, Aaron. So I, in my preparation, watch a lot of your interviews. I reached out, I talked to your daughter a little bit. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I said, what should I ask your dad? And she said a few things about my dad that may not be obvious is who don't know him well is he comes across as strictly business minded which i don't think you do by the way um he's actually very compassionate and tender-hearted and and he she said i admire him for being a success in business but the dad he was to my sister and i were was his biggest success is what she said and your fun fact is what happens when you watch the biggest loser Oh my goodness. Here we go. I'm exposing myself right here in front of the whole world. I cry. I can't help it because these people are so distraught when they go in with all this extra weight and they yeah. come out a different person. And it's just exciting to me to see them find a new life. And I'm like, their life's going to be different as a result of losing all this weight. And they're so excited and they always want to tell their mom or dad or whoever their loved ones are. And it's just an emotional thing. I guess my daughter's right. I'm an old tender hearted, you know, but it's true. I mean, it, it does. It makes me cry. <laughs> yeah. And in that, you know, I want to talk about how you raise your kids, you know, the value system there yeah. um, with business and family, because we talked about right before we started recording is you don't want the family to be a casualty. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Because I see it happen every day. You know, we get sucked into this black hole of being successful mm -hmm. and we really forget what success is. And the number one successful thing you can do is be the great dad or husband, you know, to your wife or to your children. And I see it time and time again, there's very notable folks you would know who they are that I happen to know their backstory and they have forsaken their entire family mm -hmm. uh, for more possessions, more tangible articles, more right. money. And they come home one day and they don't know their wife and they don't know their children. And it's really, that's really sad to me. Yeah. So how did you and your wife instill that value system and raise your kids that you know other people should look at and think about doing also? Yeah, well, Robin and I both came from a background where our parents didn't have anything. I mean, literally anything. We lived in an 800-square-foot house. You know, there were four children. My dad was an honorable man, high character, great morals, uh, my mom as well. But my dad was a terrible businessman. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is my dad didn't care anything about making money. It just wasn't high on his radar. My dad enjoyed doing things with the family. He loved to hunt. He loved to fish. He was a great man. He loved people. That was a strong uh, attribute my dad had. So I didn't really learn about business. I what did he do 
Aaron? He was a general contractor. Okay. And he physically built the houses. I oh, mean, wow. he, he dug the footings. He built the houses. He physically. Tough work. Yeah, it's very hard. Matter of fact, it was one of the inspirations for me uh, as a young man. I knew what I didn't want to do in life. It Which wasn't was what? I, I didn't want to build those houses. Mm. I didn't want to get out and physically have to work that hard. You know, I don't want to get on here and tell all these stories about how hard I had it. I didn't even know I had it hard, right? Yeah. It was, you know, we live where we lived. And, you know, my yeah. dad gave $6,500 for the house I grew up in. Yeah. And then we lost everything in bankruptcy uh, wow. when I was in the third grade. Uh, my dad was a terrible businessman. And then we moved in with my cousins for a period of time. And then my dad rented a house. And then we lived there until I graduated from high school. Mm. And so he was just not a good businessman. That's not knocking him. He just wasn't a good businessman. Right. And my dad grew up really, really tough as well. And so I didn't learn that part of it. So Robin grew up that way or worse. Really? Right? My wife did. Yeah, she had a really, really difficult situation as well. Her dad was a plumber. And so when we got married, we decided that we were going to do things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. You we got married young. Are you two, two weeks out of high school? Right. Right. So, well, my story was, is I went to night school and summer school for about 18 months and I had enough credits in the 11th grade of high school to graduate. So I didn't even have to go my junior year and senior year because I had enough credits. And mm. so I only went twice my senior year to register and to walk the line. I wanted to graduate with my class. Right. So I was a year ahead of Robin. She graduated. Uh, her, her dad uh, moved to Texas. Her mom and dad got a divorce and her dad moved to Texas while we were dating. And so Robin had a really tough time. He had a single, you know, mom raising my, you know, Robin's the baby of seven children. Wow. She was the last one to leave. And so quite honestly, and she wouldn't mind me telling this story, but I kind of helped them, you know, while we were dating. Matter of fact, I went and bought Robin a car. I was doing okay at 18. I had started a business and it was pretty successful. And uh, I went down, I thought I was self that I went down. I said, Hey, you know, we're going to get married, pick out a car. So she bought a, a firebird formula. It was jet black, had a <laughs> brush velour blue interior. I thought I was something. She thought she was bad too, because she drove this brand new firebird formula to school her senior year, but I bought it for, you know, while we were dating. And then two weeks after she graduated, we got married. But so that's a good courting and, gift, Aaron. Yeah, it was, it yeah. was, I, you know, anyway, I thought I was cool. I was able to buy her a car at 18. So anyway, that that's another story. You don't care about all that. Yeah. So Anyway, uh, we get married and then we buy this condo, uh, it's less than 600 square feet, one bedroom, yeah. one bath condo, and we own a business. And we said, we're not going to go out and buy what we could afford because, uh, you know, just because we can make a payment doesn't mean we should right. do it. So we elected to delay gratification. How did we, you know to do that or how did we, you have the discipline to do we that? We wanted to do it right. Yeah. We didn't want to do like a lot of people do that they start doing good. They go out and start borrowing money and getting a bigger house and right. all these huge car notes. I just didn't want to do that. Yeah. We just didn't. We said, hey, we've got a golden opportunity here. I don't want to screw it up. Right. And so, uh, because I'd met a couple of guys that had money hmm. and I said, we may never get this opportunity again. Mm -hmm. You know, it may be, uh, so anyway, uh, we put the money back into the business. We said, we're not going to take all the profits. We're going to put the money back in the business. Yeah. And we had borrowed $150,000 when I was 18 years old. Now, Jeremy, I don't know about you, but that's a lot of money today. But when you're 18, <laughs> 35 years ago, yeah. that was, that was 37 years ago. Now that was a lot of money. For I sure. don't know what, what do you equate to today, but that's a lot of money. And I said, I don't want to be on the hook for that because I have a hard time enough sleeping as it is, right. you know, even owing that money. So it was a 10 year loan and we paid it back in 36 months. And so yeah. now what did you do with it when you got that? What'd you do with the, the loan? What do you mean? What I mean, you invest it off. for your we, business. Yeah, we paid the loan off. We took the proceeds, you know, from the profits and we paid the loan off. And now I got a paid for business at 21. Yeah. And we're. You know, yeah, we're feeling pretty good. So then I went and bought another business and we did the same thing. And it took about four years and we paid it off. And then by this time, we had two children. I had two daughters. And uh, we bought a little house. We gave $79,000 for this house, uh, not 
10 miles from Nashville and we gutted it and redid it, kind of made it our own and we kept it. And then uh, when I was about 25 by this time, uh, we bought a piece of land because things are pretty good now. We got a couple of paid for businesses and they're doing good. And we opened our third store. If you've ever been to Nashville at the corner of fifth and broad, there's a place there now, but we used to have a pawn shop there. And then across the street was Rose Loan Company uh, next to Ernest Tub Record Shop, and we went and bought it. So now I'm 27. We got four stores. Mm. I've got a partner that wants to take all the money out of the business, mm. and that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because he's 70-something years old at this point. And I don't know about you, Jeremy, but I'm going to be siphoning off some money. <laughs> I'm set. Well, I'm still a young guy, right? I'm still young. So we work out a deal to where we consolidate a couple of the stores and we let him take the stores. And it was a friendly separation. It wasn't, you know, it was like, hey, I don't want to take the money out. You do. Here's your stores. You do what you want to. And he did. Right, right. And he enjoyed himself and lived a good long time and ran those businesses. They were good. And But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to reinvest the money because right. I was building. I was young and I had children. I had obligations ahead of me. And so about that time, we bought a new property uh, in Inglewood, which is about six miles from Nashville. And we tore down the building that was there. That's another story in itself. My uncle and my grandfather used to own that property like 50 years prior mm. to me buying it. So I bought it back from the guy he sold it to. Paul Blankenship was his name. We tore the building down. I built a new state-of-the-art pawn shop. It was about 5,000 square feet. Wow. Had a really cool office, you know, private bath. I mean, it was really, it was uptown. You know, I think I'm somebody, I'm 27, and I got this, you know, it was nice. Nice, I mean, it, real nice, yeah. So, so anyway, uh, one day these guys walk in, introduce themselves, and they said, uh, I'm the chief financial officer, you know, for Cash America. And I, I didn't even know who Cash America was. And he said, we're a publicly traded company. We're in Fort Worth, Texas, and we're growing through acquisitions, and we want to buy your store. And I quickly told him I wasn't for sale. I said, mm -hmm. I'm not. Uh, I'm 27, and I'm not for sale. We just built this new location. And uh, he said, well, we really want to buy it because you got the nicest stores. you got a couple of really cool stores, one out on Knowles Road and one here. We want to buy them. And finally, they left. And a couple months later, they came back. And they said, we want to buy this store. And I said, I started laughing. I said, it's not for sale. You know, we're doing good. I'm 27. What would I even do? He said, we don't care what you do. We want to buy your store. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, by that time, you know, I'm like, I'm a little frustrated, you know. And, and quite honestly, and I'm just being honest with you, I, I was a little cocky, just to be honest. You wouldn't have liked me, You're, Jeremy. You wouldn't, wouldn't have liked me on your show when I was 27 years old because I had came from nothing. I had done okay, yeah. right? And now I'm like, hey, you know, I, I'm thinking I'm the guy, which is not true. It later got me in trouble. So uh, anyway, I'm like, uh, okay, you didn't hear me clearly. I'm not for sale. So they went away. A couple months later, they came back. And now I'm really upset. We go into my office and he said, uh, Aaron, he said, hypothetically, let's just play for a minute. Hypothetically, if you were going to sell, I know you're not, but if you were, what would you sell the business for? And I thought, well, I'll just get rid of them. I'll just price it a little bit high and I'll get rid of them. And I told them and they said, we'll take it. And I, I start laughing and he just sits there, you know, and looks at me. And I said, well, that was hypothetical. He said, well, we met your number. So realistically, we want to buy you. Hmm. Well, now they had my attention and I'm like, hmm. let me go home and talk to Robin. Let me talk to my banker. And yeah. I did. They stayed in town. They came back. And so anyway, uh, make a long story short in about 30 days, I was 27. I'd wow. retire. And so there I go. But Robin and I had decided that our way of thinking paid off because if we had spent the money, we wouldn't have built it to three or four stores right. and a fortune 500 company wouldn't have wanted it. Now I didn't know that was coming, but I did know that if you pay it off, you've got value. If right. you grow it bigger, other people might want it or you'd have, so we delayed gratification, not knowing we were delaying gratification, mm -hmm. but it just made sense and it paid off. And that's the way Robin and I mm -hmm. kind of elected to do it. We're pretty conservative people. Even today, uh, we live in a 2,800 square foot house, uh, back in the woods. It's very modest. It's a nice house and we've made it ours. And yeah. 
I could afford much bigger and but but I don't want it because it kind of holds you captive because right. when it's big it's nice but I don't need big. We live in three rooms, the den and the sunroom and our bedroom and right I don't need all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. And so Robin I want to talk about I want to talk about after you sold it cuz I know some things went on mentally for you but but going back a little bit, how did you even get into pawn shops? Yeah, when I was 13 years old uh, my dad asked me that summer, he said, uh, I'm going to remodel a pawn shop in Madison, mm -hmm. which is another little suburb of Nashville. And he said, you want to help me and make some money during the summer? I said, well, sure. I'm all, if I make some money, I'm all in. Right. And so we took this, uh, it was a weight workout place, a gym. It was a little small place. And we turned it into a pawn shop. He remodeled it, took the whole summer to do it. And at the end of the project, the owner, Herb Berry, uh, which his family had been in business in Nashville since 1941. He was 23 years old, and he was opening this store. Really? In yeah, hmm. he, he was 23, and he just finished college. Go Vols. He's a Tennessee graduate. So anyway, he comes to Nashville. Uh, he lives in Nashville, but he comes to Madison. And uh, I just approached him one day and said, listen, I go to school just down the street. I live a couple of miles from here. When you get open... Uh, I didn't even know what a pawn shop was, by the way. I said, do you need any help? He said, what would you do? And I said, I'll do whatever you want. I'll right. clean up. I'll sweep. I'll do whatever you want. He said, you're hired. And it was that <laughs> way. A I good said, answer. A good answer. History, right. Yeah. And so I started working there, and I really loved it. It was like the people, you were cool, you know, and uh, people would bring in tools. They'd bring in guns. They would bring in things I enjoyed, you know, and then they diamond rings. And I'm like, Two weeks into it, I said, Mr. Barry, what what are we doing? <laughs> he said, wait, wait. I said, all these people are coming in with all this different stuff, and you're giving them money, and I'm putting it up in the back room. What what are we doing? And he said, well, let me explain it to you. So he said, a lot of people can't go to the bank and borrow money, and they use us as a short-term loan. Mm. We're just keeping their stuff. We're loaning them money. When they pay the money back in some interest, they get their stuff back. Well, I got that pretty easy. Well, what was interesting to me was it was so diverse. There was just so many different things that we dealt with. Yeah. I, I play the guitar. You know, this is Nashville. Everybody plays the guitar. <laughs> so I got to fool with stuff that I loved, and I just grew to love that. And when I was 15, Jeremy, I decided I was going to open my own pawn shop. Mm. I was going to make it a career, and that's what happened. So what's some of the strangest things that you, people brought in or that you sold there? Yeah, I don't know that we necessarily, you know, the the pawn stars have made it a little bit more <laughs> than it is, but uh, it was typical stuff. There wasn't really anything that I would call strange. I yeah. mean, just your normal stuff, tools, guns, guitars, musical equipment, stereo equipment, jewelry. It was just normal stuff. I get asked that question. It's a pretty common question because uh, the pawn stars guys have really made it something, you know, uh, we did take in cool stuff. Some of the things that we took in, uh, you know, or memorabilia, you know, there's country music stars mm -hmm. stuff, you know, that we would take in. Uh, Johnny Cash is gone now, but uh, some of his family members used to come in and pawn some of his stuff. And mm. I'd call him, I'd say, Mr. Cash, your stuff's back down here. He'd come and get it. And he turned into a really good customer of ours. Mm. He lived not far from our business. And so that was kind of ironic. And I said, I'll quit taking it. He goes, no, they'll pawn it somewhere else. And then I'll lose it and I won't get it back. Right. So we became friends over the years, you know, through that process. And we dealt with some cool people, local people that were musicians would come in, you know, that they'd have big hits. And it was kind of cool to see those yeah. people. But the actual articles, to answer your question, there was really nothing that yeah. stood that was really different. So, Aaron, what's the biggest challenges that you found running the pawn shops? Yeah, I'm a real high D personality. I'm an overachiever, and it was really kind of balancing myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I'm now kind of on this quest for people to be successful. And I want to be successful. I want to make money. I enjoy making money. But it can suck you in a vortex, a dark hole if you let it. Yeah. And then your pride takes over, and that's kind of what it did for me. It was kind of like, hey, you're the guy, and what you touch turns to gold. And you know, then you think you're invincible, and that's not true either. And uh, so I think some of the biggest challenges for being an entrepreneur is yeah. balance. Yeah. 
And then the second thing is focus, learning what things to focus on. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of big challenges. Yeah. So Robin, the, yeah, Robin yeah. really helps me with that. But, yes. Uh, Let's talk about that because I know we talked last time. Um, there's some tough times in entrepreneurship and being married. There's times where Robin pulled you up. Yeah. What were some of those times? What did that look like? Yeah, she was always my biggest supporter, the biggest advocate. Even last night, you know, I mean, this is now we've been married 35 years, working on 36. Even last night, I was working on a project and she came up and, you know, we're getting prepared to close everything down for the evening. And she leans over and kisses me, you know, she says, thanks for working so hard. Mm. And I'm like, well, that's pretty cool, you know, where your wife still recognizes that. And right. she kind of tears up. I said, well, you got to get make me cry. What are you doing? And she starts laughing. She tears up. She said, no, really, I, I really want you to know uh, I appreciate how hard yeah. you work. Yeah. And so that's the times that she picks me up. Robin's not a business person. She doesn't know that much about business, but she's been the anchor for our family. She, she knows she'll look over those glasses, you know, she'll go, you've worked a lot today. And I go, it's time to quit, isn't it? And she'll say, yeah, it's time to quit. Right. And so she's really guarded, uh, for my time. One thing that she did was really cool that I didn't know it was cool at the time. And I've realized it. I don't know how she kind of knew to do this, but because I am a hard charger, I get up early. I work really hard and I do, I work really, really hard when I work, but I would come home. And even when the children uh, were there young, Robin would always say, Hey, give your dad about 30 minutes, let mm. him kind of transition from being an entrepreneur, you know, she wouldn't use those words, but she'd say, let your dad transition from work to home. Right. And she would allow me to sit there in the easy chair and drink a cup of coffee or Coke or something and kind of, I don't know about you. Decompress a little bit. Yeah, well, I did. I needed to do that because we're running, you know, three or four stores and we've got dozens of employees and we're making a hundred loans a day out of each store or we're the construction and I've dealt with really difficult customers all day. It's hard to just go from that to playing with the kids and in a great mood and everything is hunky dory yeah. and I'm at home. It's hard to do that. I don't care who you are. So Robin allowed me that freedom to take about a half hour and just kind of relax. She used to tease me. She'd say, I need to send you on vacation two days ahead of us because it takes you that long to get it in a great frame of mind mm. and get your mind off work. And so she was really guarded for me in regard to that. So, you know, you, uh, moms or dads, you know, if you can allow your mate, uh, to, or, or I should have said husbands or wives, if you would allow your mate, some time to kind of decompress. And I know a lot of times I hear these stories all the time. The dad will come home and the wife will hand the children straight there and say, I'm done with them. It's your, well, that's not a good right. transition, you know? And so if you can just respect each other and Robin was always good about doing that. Mm -hmm. And so what were some other challenges with the pawn shop business? I mean, is it, how long are the hours that you put in? Yeah, the hours weren't necessarily bad. You open at 8.30, you close at 5.30, mm -hmm. you know. It's heated in the winter and it's cooled in the summer. So that wasn't some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the pawn shop business, there was always a chance that the person that pawned it, they, they didn't own it. And so mm -hmm. there was some inherent risk there. You get pretty good at discerning that. And we had a really good record. I mean, it was minuscule, the amount of things that slid by us that uh, the people didn't own. So that is some of the risk involved there. Yeah. Uh, there, there. There were other challenges in it. A lot of them self-imposed because I am an overachiever. I wanted to do good. Customer service was really, really important for us. Mm -hmm. We always had some kind of incentive program going for the employees. Yeah. Uh, we're really big on taking care of the client as we are in every business I've ever owned because that's the reason we've been successful. Right. So... When did it come? I know last time we were talking about um, the when you were in the business, um, there was uh, the Jewish community uh, yeah. that you had to work with. Yeah. I was the only Christian uh, in Nashville that was in uh, the pawn shop business. And quite honestly, I don't know if you were going to ask this or not. You may or may not, but yeah. I'll just tell you, yeah, it, was, it was one of the biggest successes for me personally. Yeah. Because when I started working for Herb Berry, and he's Jewish, 
by heritage. He's Christian by faith now. But anyway, that's another story too. But so when I left him, he offered me double my salary to stay. And this was when I was 18 years old. Mm. And I was making pretty good money then. At 18, matter of fact, I was making really good money, even in today's standards. But I worked hard. I told you I did. And he knew I worked hard. And so he doubled my salary to stay. And I just said, you told me I would never have an opportunity to own this business. And he said, you want. It's been in my family since 1941. It's a family business. You won't ever own. I said, I got this opportunity. I may never get it again. And I got to try. And it was an emotional thing for us because I'd been with him since I was 13. I was 18. It's five years. That's a third of my life at that point. You know, we've been together. He's like family, literally Mm -hmm. like family. And he said, you know, this is a Jewish business in Nashville. There's no Christians in this business. Mm. And I'm not sure how they're going to accept the fact that you're in this business. And I said, well, they'll just have, they'll have to get over it because I'm going in this business. And I did. Well, they, they did. They ostracized me for a period of time. They didn't want anything to do with me. And I befriended them. And I went to them and I said, listen, I'm not here. I'm not against you. I'm not going to ruin this business. I'm going to do good things in it, and I want you to know I'm going to. And so year after year, I would do that. Well, they finally realized that that wasn't the case. We formed an organization, and a couple of short years later, when I was 25, they made me president of the Tennessee Palm Brokers Association. Wow. And I thought that was pretty cool, you know, yeah. for a Christian to be leading a Jewish uh, organization, if you uh, if you will, and they made me president of their organization, which told me they had some confidence in me. And that was one for me personally, one of my biggest successes mm-hmm. is, is turning an adversary into an ally. Mm-hmm. And I want to encourage people now that no matter the circumstance and the situation, we can't control what is imposed on us, right. but we can control our attitude and how we deal with it. And I just don't give up. No doesn't mean no to me. No means no to me temporarily. Right. And it's just the perseverance and the grit and the determination uh, has allowed me to succeed where I might have failed in education from a uh, college institution. I've got quite the education now because I've been in business. Right. But I want to encourage people not to quit. And even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even doing the mundane tasks that are not revealing fruit now, it will, if you'll just be determined, have a plan. And we had a plan. We, we, we knew what we wanted to do. We knew where we wanted to go. I didn't want to deviate from that plan very much. Yeah. I wanted to have extreme focus. Motivation, Jeremy, will only take you so far, and people get tired because motivation is an exhaustible resource. But a plan works because I know today what I've got to do to get to that next step. So just do today what you need to do, and then tomorrow do it again. Just be repetitive, be consistent. So, Aaron, after you sold the business, what was it like after? What What was going on psychologically? For you. Yeah, well, it felt pretty good, and I even remember it like it was yesterday uh, when I was 27. Yeah. I woke up, and Robin goes, well, what are you going to do today? And I just started laughing. And I said, I'm going to do whatever I want. <laughs> and uh, she laughed, and we thought it was fun. And so a friend of mine named Bill Clendenin was in the grocery business in Nashville, and he had a house in Naples, Florida. And he knew what had transpired. And I told him that we were thinking about going to Florida for the summer. And he said, hey, no one's in my place. Just go down there, hang out. You can spend all summer. And so we did. So we took the two kids. They were small. And we took the two kids and we headed to Naples, Florida. And I don't know if you've been there, but it's a really nice place. And we stayed three weeks. And I said, I got to go home. I mean, I can't. You're getting stir crazy. Well, I I realized real quick that it was nice that we had a little bit of money, uh, but I didn't have anything to do, and boredom set in that fast. And I would go play golf, and I would go fish. And here's the thing, too. People are watching this now, and they're thinking, oh, yeah, give me such a problem. (laughs) And I know that's what they're thinking. I know this is because I've dealt with this, and I've been on that side of the fence. Right, right. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't have a reason to get up, 
uh, depression sets in. And it, it happened to me because let's fast forward now 18 months after this. I'm playing golf every day with guys 65 years old. I'm 27. Well, that was fun for a little while. The embarrassing part was they were beating me. <laughs> and that wasn't strength. too fun. They're better than me. And so I didn't like that because I like to win. The second thing is, is I didn't feel productive. I felt like I was wasting my life. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go fishing. And that was fun for the first month or two. But it's like, okay. And then I would hunt. And you kill deer, ducks, or whatever. And then you go, well, what's next? I, yeah. I mean, it's not scratching the itch like I thought. This retirement thing is cool, but it's like it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. So Robin came and woke me up one day in the middle of the day. Yeah, I'm in the bed. I'm not on the bed. I'm in the bed with the sheets and all pulled up, and I gained 50 pounds in wow. 18 months. And she woke me up. And she said, you've got a problem. And I'm like, what? What is it? And she said, no. I mean, you, look, you're in the bed. It's the middle of the day. She said, Avery, you got to do something. You got to open a company. You've got to go to work for somebody or something. I said, you're, I'm, I don't have any reason to get up. Right. So I did. I go it's back. It's the same reason probably you fought those people when you were 27. They kept wanting to buy it. And you kept saying, no, no, no. Well, you probably knew inherently. Yeah, maybe I did just yeah. instinctively. Yeah. yeah, knew I didn't really know to know, you know, because right. I had never done it. But I'm like, what would I, what would I do? So I go back to her, Barry, the guy that I worked for when right. I was 13 years old, yeah. and I said, Herb, can I work here? <laughs> he, <goes, laughs> he said, Are you already out of money? <laughs> I started laughing. <sighs> and I said, No, I'm not out of money. But I said, Man, I'm bored out of my mind. And I told you we were like family. So he right. said, listen, why don't you work here one day a week and give me a day off? Because I could use a break myself. Yeah. And he's 10 years my senior. So, you know, by this time, you know, he's, he's 37. I'm 27. And he said, I got some things at my kids' schools I want to do. And so I yeah. said, okay. So I started working there one day. And then uh, I implemented some things I had done on my own, and it started working. And he's like, man, this is cool. Business is growing. And so I said, well, listen, I got some cash, you know. And so what about I put the money in the business and we grow the business? So I started loaning the company a little bit of money and the business started to grow. Mm -hmm. And this went on for, you know, a year, year and a half. And uh, it grew really, really good. And so I went across the street again, like I did at the old place, and we I said, why don't, why don't we form a partnership? And now remember, he just told me, you know, years earlier, never. you'll never own part of this business. And I said, why don't we form a partnership? I'll buy half the company. I'm already in pretty deep because I've been loaning it money. And uh, you work three days a week. I'll work the other three days and we'll raise our family and we'll have plenty of time and we'll still have something to do. And he thought about it and he said, no, that, that's cool. He said, I, I like that. Well, now we're, by this time, we're in 1993, 94, somewhere in there. And so I go across the street and I buy this building. We tear it down. We build a new 10,000 square foot pawn wow. shop. It's really cool. Really, really nice place. Because we realized the small pawn shop that we were in is not big enough for both of us. We mm -hmm. can't increase the loans. We don't have the inventory. It doesn't, you're not going to provide the revenue that both of us need. Right. So we go over there and do that. Well, now by this time, it's 1995. And I'm at Luby's Cafeteria one morning at a Chamber of Commerce breakfast. And they got this guy speaking. And I'm listening to him. There's 25, 30 people in the room, you know, and I think, well, this is pretty cool. And I walk up and introduce myself to him. He introduces himself to me. And uh, he's going to start this radio show talking about money. And uh, you know, this guy's just starting. So I invite him to the pawn shop. I said, two miles up the road, I have this pawn shop. I want you to see it. So he came up. He fell in love with it. He said, this place is phenomenal. I mean, now this is a pawn shop. And it was 10,000 square feet. We got huge. a dozen or 15 people working there. I mean, it's going on. It's really a nice place. 
And he said, would you advertise on my show? And I said, not a prayer. There's not a <laughs> snowball's chance I'm advertising. I don't even know you. I've never even heard of you. I don't even know what you're doing. So he explains it to me. Right. And he said, if I give you one week free, would you try it? And I'm like, well, you know, it, yeah, I'll try it. What have I got to lose? So I tried it. And people come literally by the dozens. Wow. And they're buying stuff. Well, that was Dave Ramsey. And that was my first encounter with Dave Ramsey. And I called him and I said, man, I don't know what Kool-Aid you're serving these people, <laughs> but I'm all in and I want to sign a contract. I want more of this. And so he came out. There were three people in his organization at that time. And so we became friends. Yeah. And so I started advertising on Dave's show. Well, he was on one station in Nashville at that time. Now he's on 800 stations. He's got 8 million listeners right. a day. It's huge, yeah. I've been an advertiser on his show every day since 1995. Really? Yeah, either a wow. business I own or have owned, one or the other. And I was his second advertiser. And Dave invited me to join his personal mastermind group after that, and we became friends. And so the rest is kind of history in regards to that. But that's kind of how that business grew, and it took off like crazy. I can't even tell you how it took off. Well, things rocked along there for a number of years, about six years went by. 2001, July, no, August, August 1st, 2001, I met our church. We have this thing that we go, and there's about six or eight men get together, and we pray for our church. We pray for our families and our businesses, and so it's about 7.30 in the morning. I'm headed down Gallatin Road, headed to the office. And uh, there's this guy crossing the street. I see him coming, and it's a four-lane highway. And there's a bus hmm. stop on the right-hand side of the road. And I just surmise, you know, he's trying to catch the bus. He runs to the center of the median and stops. And I'm in a 2001 Lincoln Navigator, big red Lincoln Navigator. And so all this happens, Jeremy, in like three seconds, right? I mean, you know, I'm, it sounds like a long time, but like, it all happens like, like three one seconds. second, yeah. So his shoulders kind of slump, and I, he's waiting on me to pass. So I accelerate, and you know, I'm going 45, 50 miles an hour. Just as I get to him, I don't, I don't know what happened, but he takes off running for the bus and runs out in front of me, mm -hmm. and I hit him, and it, and it kills him. Wow. And so I stop on the side of the road. I get out. I'm shaking so hard. I can't dial 911 on my cell phone. I'm holding the phone in my hand and mm. trying to brace my hand, you know, and I'm shaking. And I'm, it's so surreal that it's like a dream. It's mm. like this is not happening to me. You know, it's like a movie. It's like you're watching something unfold. Yeah. And I turn around. This guy's face down. Ugh. Cars stopping everywhere. People jumping out of their cars. And it's like slow motion literally like slow motion so a couple of minutes there's police cars ambulances showing up there's it's like a freak show going on and i'm thinking god please let him be okay right. you know and it's just i'm replaying it in my mind and i'm thinking was i doing anything wrong i wasn't on the phone i wasn't drinking anything i was you know and i'm like this is not my fault and I'm convincing myself of that, you know, and so finally, you know, hours go by, they interview me and they talk to people and they said, this guy just ran right out in front of him. Well, it ends up, he's 77 years old. He's from the Philippines. He just didn't see me. He just didn't see me. And the bus driver warned him on a regular basis. You're going to get hit someday. You keep running out in front of all these cars and you're going to get hit someday. Well, you know, I was the unfortunate right. So it really rocked my world. Yeah. It really kind of took me to a place I'd never been. I mean, it really messed me up. I mean, I'm like, I've run over somebody, and you don't just get over that. Right. So I go to the office, and uh, my pastor came there, and Robin's in Florida with our girls on a mission trip, and I call her, tell her what happened, and she comes home the next day, and we talk, you know, just her and I, and I said, I'm done. You know, I, I, I'm finished. I've been chasing money. We don't need the money. I need a break. And so I went to my partner and said, we're going to, I'm going to sell out. Robin and I've talked about it and I'm selling out. So we went to dinner that night because we're like family. We worked at a deal and he said, I don't have the cash to pay you out. I said, I'll finance it over a nine or 10 year period, but I'm done. I'm finished. And I, and I was, I, I, I took a five year break. We uh, yeah. built a new house. 
Uh, we traveled extensively, and I was very grateful that I had a little bit of money that I could travel, mm -hmm. and I worked through it. And so, yeah. uh, you know, I still think about it, and I still hate it. And yeah. I called the family and paid my condolences. My attorney told me to stay away. They said, you know, that's a sensitive thing. And, but I still talked to them and they right. said, we don't hold you responsible. Yeah. And so, uh, Robin again, you know, this five years go by, she said, all right, you're getting fat and lazy again. <laughs> it's time to do something. So we built a house in that process in that five years. And I so was infatuated with the builder because of his quality. Mm-hmm. I went to him and I said, why don't we take your skills and take my money and experience and let's open a construction company that builds high-end homes. And to make a long story short, we did. And I implemented my abilities in customer service. I knew how to grow a business because I've grown a number of them. And we did well. It took off. <clears throat> Excuse me. We became number one builder three consecutive years here in Nashville, building high-end residence and small commercial. And then I turned 50 years old in that process. And I, again, for the third time said, I'm done. And I retired. What David. was it about that time? Why'd you say I'm done? Uh, okay. I could make something up that would sound really good, but I won't. And so I'll just tell you the truth. That's the most difficult business I've ever been in. Construction. Yeah, absolutely. Without a question. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how to systematize it. I couldn't figure out the processes. Uh, customers that are building mega million dollar houses uh, can't make up their mind because there's no boundaries. And they people, can do anything, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, or they do nothing. Because people that build $200,000 houses, satin, nickel, and oil rub bronze, that's your choice. Right. People that are building mega million dollar houses, there are no boundaries, and so they can't decide. Right. And that drove me crazy. Yeah. And then, no, uh, this is not a blanket statement over people that can afford those houses. But the truth of the matter is, is that they, they can be difficult. Demanding. Yeah. And so I'm like, <clears throat> okay. And then we had a couple that just said at the end, we're not going to pay you. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I can fight this legally, but it'll cost me more, you know. And one problem after another, I just said, I don't need this either. And right. so I'm selling it's that. Not worth I, it. Yeah, so I retired at 50. Well, Dave Ramsey uh, told me, he said, man, you're too young to quit. Dan Miller told me, he said, Big A, they call me Big A. He said, Big A, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. And so Dave Ramsey gifted me Entree Leadership Mastery Series, which is a pretty cool gift. It's about 10 grand to go to that. And I said, hey, I'm up for that. So I went and I loved it. Yeah. It was just so intriguing, you know. And then I went to Dan Miller's Innovate. And uh, Dan said, uh, try it out because with your experience, your marriage and your businesses, you need to help other young guys and you need to help guys that know what they want to do to grow their business mm -hmm. because you've been so successful. Mm -hmm. I started doing it and now, Jeremy, I have national and international clients and I lead mastermind groups. You know, I have three groups that I lead and then I do coaching one-on-one. -on -one. We started the community, which is really cool. For $37, mm -hmm. you can belong to the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have guys all over uh, the globe that are in there. I, I do webinars for one hour a week, and then we have a forum where guys come and interact. It gives them exposure to me. Yeah. Uh, we can ask questions. There's dialogue going on. It's just a really cool thing, and it's very affordable. Yeah. And because of that, guys are joining pretty quick, and yeah. we've got guys that are just starting businesses. And we've got guys that have run $600 million companies. And so there's a real diversity. It's a big range. Yeah. yeah. But it's good because you can always be a mentor and you can always be a mentee. Mm -hmm. And so it's designed and developed uh, for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get more into view from the top. Iron sharpens iron, which is one of your masterminds in the community too. First, I want to talk about masterminds. This has been huge in your life. Um, yeah. What are some of the big lessons you learned from the people in your mastermind, Dave Ramsey, Dan Miller, what, what lessons does each of them teach you? Yeah, we have to go back a little bit yeah. and people say all the time, well, yeah, who wouldn't be in that group, right? I mean, that's what people say, but let right. me point out in 1995, Dave Ramsey had to give me advertising because I didn't know who he was, right? right? He wasn't who He's, he is right. now right. then. So that hope, of guys now that don't have international 
you know, notorious Nashvilleians or whoever. Right. Ken Abraham is in the group. He's got a hundred books in print now, ten right. times New York Times. He wasn't then. Right. Dan Miller didn't have forty eight days to the work you love. He does now. Right. So I'm saying that collective energy of people yeah. being transparent and honest, mm -hmm. let the facade down yeah. and tell the truth. See, because when you have guys that don't have anything to gain or lose as a direct result of what they tell you, they'll yeah. tell you the truth. When you've got a family member or a business partner, they're going to probably tell you what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the blatant honesty of being in that group, and man, we'd have some free for -alls. I mean, they would, Tell me about they, it. They, well, they would be ugly if we disagree, you know, one guy'd say that sucks or that's not good. And you need to, well, what do you mean it isn't good? This is my stuff. You can't, you know, and then they just be honest with what, what they think. Yeah. I mean, people would bring ideas to the table and yeah. you go, you idiot. What are you thinking? That is terrible. And here, and then you get a general consensus. That is really terrible. <laughs> well, it hurts your feelings. But the truth is right. I'd rather be embarrassed in front of those guys than right. invest a fortune in something that was really right. bad. Right. So and what was something for you, Aaron, that you brought? You're like, this is amazing. They're going to love well, it. Yeah. I tell you what helped me more than bringing a deal. And here's what I was going through a really dark time at one point in our group. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's not even relevant what it was, but the point is it was a really dark time in my life mm -hmm. and uh, I couldn't get over it. And Jeremy, I don't know if you've ever been there where you're stuck. I mean, yeah. you're just like, hey, gum, I'm stuck. I think I we're all, we all yeah. are there at some point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but I couldn't get over it. And I was talking about it ab nauseum. It was like, should I do this or should I do this? And I'd catch Dave Ramsey looking over at Dan Miller with those little, and I'm like, what does that mean? What was that look? You know, I mean, just tell me. And they'd be like, well, maybe you ought to do this or do that, you know, and then it wouldn't set well. So one day, one day I'm at Ace Hardware and my phone rings and I look down, and it's one of the members, James Ryle. And James was a promise keeper speaker, traveled all over the world speaking, best storyteller I've ever heard. Hmm. That has nothing to do with the story. But so I look down and I'm like, this is going to be really good or really bad because right. we don't call each other on the weekends. You know, we protect that for the family. And I answer the phone and James said, Aaron, have you got a minute? And I said, uh, yeah, hold on. I'm at Ace Hardware in Hendersonville, but let me go outside so I can hear you. And I went, I was excited. I thought this is going to be good because he didn't sound distraught. Right. And so I go outside and he said, you know, Aaron, I was praying for you this morning hmm. and God gave me a word for you. And I thought, wow, James Ryle saying this, this is like, you know, he's got a direct connection with God. You know, this is going to be really good. And he said, are you ready? And I said, yeah, man, I'm amped up. I'm like, I don't have anything to write with, but yeah, what is it? He goes, you're wearing the hell out of everybody in our group. Hmm. And I start laughing. He goes, no, no, I, I'm serious. Well, then I got mad. I said, what are you talking about? He said, this thing you're stuck on. He said, you just keep on talking about it. You keep bringing it every Wednesday on and on, just ab nauseum. You're just talking about it. He said, this morning I was reading in Isaiah where it says, take the chains from around your neck and move on. Hmm. He said, brother, it's time you were moving on. And he hung up. I'm like, there I said, I'm it. standing there with a the phone up and, and he hangs up on me. Well, I was so mad. I could have bit a nail in two. I was out there in that parking lot. I felt humiliated. I felt mm -hmm. embarrassed. I was mad that he had the audacity, you know, and then I thought, now, you know what? That's the truth. Hmm. He just spoke truth into my life. I went back to the group the next week, and I thanked him, and I apologized to the group. And you know what's the best part? I moved on. He unstuck me. Hmm. You know, If we hadn't have spent years and years and years together, he wouldn't have had the right to say that to me, right? right? I'd punch you probably if you told me it. he had the right, right? He, right. He'd invested the time, the energy and the effort in me. So I can tell you other times that we've all done that to each other, mm. but it's personal life. It's like, man, you're working too much. It's yeah. like, Hey, Robin is not, let me just, let me fire a warning shot. You keep working like you're working. You keep opening these stores. You keep doing this and that. You keep doing that. You're yeah. going to come home one day to a house full of strangers. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of money and a bunch of strangers, and you're not going to know your kids. Yeah. 
So that's, you know, we could talk for days over stuff like that. Matter of fact, get my book, An Eagle's View. That's what the book is about. And uh, it comes out in the spring of 2016, maybe the summer of 2000. Eagle's View. And Eagle's View. Oh, and, 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 and Eagle's View. Eagle's View. And so uh, that's, that's going to be a really cool book. And it's going to have story after story like that. These guys have done the same thing. Dave Ramsey would come in and say, man, I'm stuck. And here's where I'm stuck. You know, it's not something he wanted to tell his personal board or his family, right. but he needed. We need, Jeremy, we need people in our life that will tell us the truth. Yeah. And so that's what masterminds have done for me. Not, yeah. not counting the tips, you know, that they give you, the resources, yeah. the latest apps, the technology, the introductions are huge. It's like, hey, I got this guy here. You need to meet him. Right. I got this guy here. You need to meet him. Right. And we're all about connectors. I love to connect people. Masterminds, yeah. they're great connectors. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That is, that is amazing. And talking about transition to view from the top. And what are some of the big breakthroughs that you've seen with people in the group that you've yeah. uh, facilitated? Yeah, what's pretty cool in there is we have guys, our avatar, you know, our ideal client is 25 to 55, mm -hmm. and it's entrepreneurs. You mm -hmm. know, we have some corporate people in our groups, and that's great, but entrepreneurs are kind of who I resonate with. That's the way I think. You know, in the corporate world, thinks a little bit differently than entrepreneurs. Some of the breakthroughs that I've seen is men need accountability. We have great ideas, mm -hmm. but we really suffer on execution. But if, Jeremy, you were to come to me and say, these are the top three things I want to accomplish in the fourth quarter of 2015, I'm going to hold you accountable for doing that. If you come back next week and there's been no progress, it's like, well, why haven't you done that? You mm -hmm. said last week you were going to do this. Right. Well, you're only going to take that embarrassment a few weeks, and you're going to do it. Right. And when you do it, their success comes as a direct result of it. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is it helps you focus in blocks of time. Greg McCowan wrote a great book called Essentialism mm -hmm. and where we think we can do 15 things well, but you can't. You can only do two or three things well. Right. And I don't believe in multitasking at all. You know, you physically, mentally, intellectually can't think of two separate projects simultaneously. Right. So when you focus intently, you get a lot more done. And yeah. I help guys do that. Then the accountability Young guys of not growing too fast, but growing deliberate. We help guys with that. I've got a client that's got a 10-year-old business. He's 31 years old. He hired me 18 months ago. He owed $167,000 on his house. Hmm. He owed $550,000 on his business. He had done $2 million in gross revenue when I met him in 18 months. Just through accountability, just through the goals that he set, mm -hmm. and just through some implementation of some things that I told him, this year he'll do four million in gross revenue. Wow. He's paid his house off and he's paid his business off. Yeah, took him eighteen months. He would not have done that without coaching and accountability and being in a mastermind group because he didn't know what he didn't know. Right, and he didn't know to be held accountable, so he was left to his own demise, if you will, of just being able to do what he knew how to do. You've got to be willing to subject yourself to that kind of scrutiny and be transparent and open and be willing to learn. And when you do that, success comes as a result of it. Yeah. So what's your favorite story from Iron Sharpens Iron, Mastermind? You know what? Maybe it's that one that I just mm. told in regards to seeing a guy that was 31. He wasn't yeah. involved at his church. Now he's leading a men's group. He's got a small group in his home. Uh, he drank alcohol at the time and he knew that it wasn't good for him. He's quit. Uh, he's paid his house off. He's paid his business off. Uh, he's growing with leaps and bounds right now. He's got systems implemented. Uh, there's strategies now that we do. We're focused on what he's trying to do. Yeah. It's not just go out and do the best you can. He's implemented a plan and a strategy. He's getting to spend more time with his children now than he ever has. And he's doubled his revenue. How does that work? And so we're just able to coach through those things. Yeah. So what did you see in him or someone else that, that maybe they didn't see? There was a huge block that was so obvious, but someone just can't see it for themselves. Well, one of the things with him personally as an individual, he's a high D personality, and he thought he could go in there with a baseball bat and get people to submit to the things he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But we've done disc profiles. 
Uh, he's hired me to coach his key people, which I've done. And uh, there, there's a great book, Good to Great, that Collins wrote that yeah. teaches us how to be level five leaders. Yeah. He'd never even heard of a level five leader. He just thought, well, this is the way you do it. And that's not always the case. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And because you're the owner of a company and you think you can go in and rule with an iron fist, yeah. that's not always the best way. And right. it's a lot easier and better to lead people than it is to drive them. Yeah. And that's been his key takeaway. For sure. And this has been hugely valuable. I have one last question before I ask it. Where can we point people towards what they should check out online? Uh, for you and view from the top. Yeah. View from the com is where you can find me. Twitter is at VFT coach. And there again, I do the thing I'm most excited about is the community right now. You can go on my website, view from the com, and a little box will pop up and say, would you like to join the community? That is probably my number one focus right now because it's mm -hmm. so affordable and it can make such a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. We have created a landing page just for your audience. Mm, that's view great. From, yep. Viewfromthetop.com forward slash inspired insider, all in lowercase letters. There's three documents that I've taken the price off of and I'm going to give your audience. Mm. One is a personal assessment. One is a document called What Do I Want? And the third one is Steps to a Productive Day. It helps you implement yeah. some of the things I've talked to. So go to that landing page, viewfromthetop.com forward slash inspired insider. And yeah. you can have those documents. Hopefully they'll help you. Oh, I had no idea. That's very generous of you. Okay. Um, Aaron, my last question is, we talked about a lot, a lot of different things. What should we leave people with? in their business if they want to improve their business or their family or their balance? Yeah, there's two things that's kind of my life mantra. Yeah. And they're silly little quotes, but they've made a huge impact on me personally. First of all is can't, couldn't do it, mm -hmm. and could, did it all. I want <laughs> that's you a to mouthful. Have, yeah, it is. My mom told me that as a little kid, she would not allow us to say can't. Mm -hmm. She'd say, you might not be able to do it, but you're going to try. Mm. And so that perseverance and grit and determination that I talked about earlier was yeah. really instilled in me at an early age. The biggest thing that holds people back is fear of something. Mm -hmm. And I simply say, fear missing an opportunity more than you fear failure. And if you will implement that strategy in your life, the can't, couldn't do it, and could did it all, and fear missing an opportunity more than you fear failure, you'll be hugely successful at whatever you attempt. Yeah. Aaron? Thank you so much. Everyone check out viewfromthetop.com. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. See you, buddy. Thank Have you. A Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.